I'm really delighted to be here to um, share with you my vision for what uh, a feminist city might be. As a girl growing up in London, I learnt very early on to be vigilant in public spaces. By the age of 12 or 13, my friends and I were all too aware of the way that existing as a girl in the city put us at risk. Whether or not it was the shock of being groped for the first time when I was walking home from school, the shame that followed uh, being, having been stalked and being told by a woman in the street that it was my fault for having been out far too late for such a young girl. Or whether or not it was the um, embarrassment that followed having my newly developing breasts ogled at by strangers, or in fact, learning what curb crawling was when it was happening and my friend standing next to me said, I should look down, uh, walk fast and pretend not to notice. It is the multiple and constant threats that young women experience that tell us that this is not a place, the city is not a place where they belong. I, and most young women across the world, have been let down by a system that does not prioritise or even really understand what our needs are. And to some extent, I think we already understand what the social aspects of this problem are. We know that bystanders are unlikely to intervene when they see a woman being harassed in the street. We know that problems with the policing system means that sexual harassment often goes unreported and even more so um, under-prosecuted. But I argue, and I'd like to argue here today, that this is also a problem of physical infrastructure design. It's also the unlit streets that make women feel unsafe at night. It's the poor provision of public toilets. It's the overcrowded uh, public transport systems that means that assaults go unnoticed. And it's the lack of safe public spaces where women simply feel safe to stop and rest. And this brings us to our topic, the feminist city. For me, a feminist city is way more than simply a city free of sexual violence. The feminist city, for me, is a city where there is equal access to the resources that the city has to offer, regardless of any gender identity, any protected characteristics such as race, class, sexual orientation or physical ability. And for me, as a lifelong feminist, and a civil engineer and an urban researcher, it's been my absolute privilege and pleasure to be exploring over the past few years the ways, the practical ways in which we can make the city uh, better designed for women as well as men, and by an extension, a uh, diversity of body types. Because I really believe that the city is an amazing place of opportunity and liberation. It's where people go to seek work, employment, education. It's where cultures collide and new ideas are seeded. But at the moment, the current state of city infrastructure means that those privileges, those liberties are unevenly distributed. I think it's clear for a lot of us to be able to understand how physical uh, limitations uh, ac uh, limit access to the city. We know that someone in a wheelchair has a vastly different capability of moving freely around the city and accessing the um, opportunities that the place provides. If you look at a dis disability access tube map, you'll see that it's way, lim way, way limited. Um, and that doesn't just affect a freedom of movement and a freedom of access to the cultural resources of the city, but it also affects economic status. When people have to spend more money, more percentage of their income on things like taxis just to be able to uh, survive, it means that there's less money, less freedom to spend on other things. And that is, has all been a design decision. And I would argue that now, this moment in history, it is especially important for us to be thinking about this and getting it right. Currently, 50%, over 50% of the world's population currently lives in cities. That's 
way over three billion people. And the fact that what, uh, three million people every week are moving to cities across the world means that by 2050, in about 30 years' time, we'll be having 70% of our global population living in cities. That is 2.5 billion more people living in cities. And by the end of this century, we expect 90% of the global population to be living in urban environments. What that means is that the decisions that we make about the inclusivity of our public spaces right now will affect the quality of life of most people on the planet by the end of this century. And today, what I'm going to try and convince you of is that from a physical infrastructure perspective, the exclusion of certain groups in our society is, from a design perspective, a matter of choice. However unconsciously that choice is made. And in order to explore that idea a bit further, it's useful to understand how cities come about, how are they built. Well, predominantly, it's by built environment professionals. You can become a professional in this. Um, this is a, a profession made up of urban planners, uh, civil engineers. The problem is that they are not taught to critically understand or critically analyse the ways in which their design decisions have social implications, the ways in which one scheme over another might affect behaviour in a different way. Moreover, we know that in most countries across the world, the built environment industry is predominantly dominated by men. Now, this is an issue not only because the um, economic benefit uh, of, of um, these professions goes predominantly to male, uh, to men, but it means that uh, because we naturally design for our own experience, because we naturally imagine what the possibilities and the best kind of place could be based on our own understanding of what good is, it means if we don't have a representative design industry making these cities, then we are at a severe disadvantage in making sure that these spaces are inclusive and accessible to all. And the first time I really came across this issue was pretty early on. It was when I was a 16-year-old A-level student and I was lucky enough to get my first work experience in an engineering firm. The engineer on site took me out to a site visit and showed me a pier that he'd been involved in designing. Now, he explained to me that because of the physical parameters of the space, it was actually impossible to make sure that it was wheelchair accessible at low tide. And so my 16-year-old uh, solution-driven, excited engineering brain kicked in, and I came up with like three or four potential ways that they could have got around it. Maybe make the ramp longer, maybe think about a lift system. And um, he listened patiently to my ideas and then kind of nodded his head and explained to me that although my ideas might work, they were way too complicated and way too, too expensive and that the client simply wouldn't accept it. And so that was my first um, kind of understanding um, of engineering practice. It showed me then that when it came to the crunch, value for money trumped values. A design that didn't work for people in a wheelchair 40% of the time was seen as a good enough solution. Here, the uh, people in wheelchairs were simply too complicated to include, and that was seen as acceptable. But what strikes me as I think back on that time as an adult now is that he had first said that it was physically impossible. For me, that is because he had so internalised the economic knowledge systems and the value systems that made that decision acceptable, then it might as well have been a physical impossibility to do it any other way. And I argue that this, these kinds of thinking is endemic in our infrastructure design systems. And therefore, it is absolutely of no surprise to me is that as I've been analysing all sorts of different infrastructure systems in cities, I see this inequality play out over and over again. So I want to give you some examples of how this plays out in practice. 
One, one clear example is in the design of urban transport networks. If you think about how cities are designed, they're usually designed to optimise flow into the city in the morning and out of the city in the evening. Now, the assumption that goes into that is that we should be optimising the city for people who are accessing the paid, economically productive uh, labour force. And that design is to the exclusion of people who are trying to make local journeys. I think if you um, have spent any time in a city like London, you will, you will know that it's pretty tricky to get um, around uh, your local area, much easier to go in and then come out. And that has a social implication. It means that people who have caring responsibilities, potentially who have to go to the school, to the shops, the GP, maybe visit an elderly neighbour or family member, often carrying, uh, may potentially shopping um, or pushing uh, p uh, young children in a pram, or people who access um, caring work that is often based on nighttime work and shift work. It means that those people are not accounted for and are best, at best an afterthought in the urban design process. And I've also seen this played out more recently in my work looking at gender and cycling. Um, we know that in most cities across the world, approximately 70% of cycling journeys are undertaken by men. In London, it's roughly 74%. Uh, in a recent study in San Francisco, it was 71% of people who were cycling were men. And of course, there's nuances with that. Within the female population who are cycling, women of Asian descent and Latina women were also disproportionately underrepresented. Elderly people, too, found that the, there were uh, fears around accessing cycling because of um, uh, worries about trips and falls and accidents and the potential health implications that that might have. But it doesn't have to be that way. In cities like um, uh, uh, countries like Denmark and the Netherlands, uh, women are actually overrepresented in cycling, carrying about 50, out about 55% of all cycling journeys. So when we think about what a gender lens in cycling infrastructure provision might mean, it would mean taking the experiences of women seriously. It would mean making sure that the cycle lanes are appropriately lit at all times of day. It would mean making sure that they were physically removed from where cars were going. Because that takes seriously women's uh, safety concerns and encourages uh, and removes the barriers to cycling. And if we want more sustainable cities, then we need to take those matters seriously. Similarly, from a public space perspective, study after study has shown that women feel much more uncomfortable than men simply sitting in public spaces. They often feel that they have to be doing something or actively participating in some activity so as not to make themselves kind of a target. Over the last few years, Vienna has been doing amazing work on gender mainstreaming and their urban planning work. And so they were taking that matter seriously. And what they decided to do was a study into the use of public parks in Vienna. So they observed what was going on. They measured between sex, age, race, who were using the public parks. And what they found was that after the age of nine, young girls stop, stopped going to the park. And so a massive consultation was under, uh, undertaken to understand what those issues were. And the design solution that came out of it was to create much more segregated um, areas um, for different types of activity to be carried out in the park. This meant that girls and boys no longer had to um, socially work out what space they were al allowed to use. The, the um, sports activities were in a certain place and there were other um, different types of spaces provided. And they found after this solution was implemented that there was 50-50 use of that public space. And so these are just a few examples about how small design interventions or different ways of thinking about providing physical infrastructure can radically transform who is able to access what infrastructure, what benefits of the city at what time. And so I would like to invite you 
the next time you see someone struggling to get a pram down the stairs. Or when you see an elderly person stopping in the street with nowhere to sit down. Or potentially a, an aggressive cyclist. Or maybe even the next time you feel harassed or intimidated in public spaces. To consider the ways in which that has, to some extent, been a design choice made by engineers and designers who do not truly understand the social implications of their design decisions. And finally, when we try to bring this up in our industry, when I try to bring in aspects of social justice and feminism to the discussion, it's often sidelined. It's seen as a nice other separate thing that we might do one day once we've got to the you know, real strong business of making things, making the city and building it. But for me, the success of any city is contingent on its ability to serve all of the people in a city, not just the middle-aged men who are building it. When people are excluded from public spaces, they are excluded from the opportunities and liberty that the city has to offer. And I intend to spend the next however many years of my career continuing to make that point and trying to make cities that work for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>